have you here as a father. Now, generally, men don't make a huge deal out of Father's Day. I've learned that. We've tried to have some activities and different things, and fathers are like, hey, just let me be at home, okay? Especially on Sunday, give them a good steak or a burger, okay? Take them to lunch, and then let them have an uninterrupted nap in their lazy boy, and that will make a father very, very, very happy, okay? Usually, they want the TV on, and they don't want you to touch the TV, okay? They want the game on, but even though they're not watching it, they want it on, they want to know it's on, and they're taking their nap there. So just do this this one day of the year. But history says that Father's Day became a national celebration on June 19, 1924. It was put into action by the proclamation of President Calvin Coolidge, and it has been a day to celebrate dads ever since. Now, if you don't know this by now, dads are built different. They're great, but they're built different. I have a few stories that I looked up, and I saw one story where it says a mother, she left her room in the maternity ward to go down to the nursery, and she found her husband staring at his newborn baby. The mother couldn't tell. He was captivated by the baby, but she was watching him, and she saw how intently he was staring and looking down at the baby. She was so touched that finally she tiptoed up behind him, slipped her arms through his and said, Honey, what are you thinking? He said, I just can't understand how they made this crib for only $89.95. Doesn't make any sense. Ruined the moment right there. There's another story of a young father-to-be who was pacing back and forth. He was nervously, he was wringing his hands in the hospital waiting room while his wife was in labor. Finally, a nurse opened the door and she said, Well, sir... You have a baby, little, a little baby girl. He heaved a sigh of relief and said, I'm glad it's a girl. She'll never have to go through the agony I spent tonight. Wow. Fathers are built different, right? But tonight, or today, we're going to look at a specific father in the Bible that God used. And I want to look at these two verses here. I had you turn to Hebrews, and I want you to look at this first. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. The father that we're going to be looking at, there's two verses written in here about him that we're going to look at specifically in Hebrews 11, verse 7, and also Genesis 6 and verse 8. In the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, it says this, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, listen to this, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now, if you look at Genesis 6 and verse 8, it'll be up there on the screen for you as well. But this is a famous verse told about Noah. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We're going to quickly review the story of Noah, thinking about who Noah was. And many of us have heard the stories of Noah since we were in Sunday school. We've heard them in kids' church, all those kind of times. But I want to really think about some specific things to fathers today. We know at the time of Noah, the earth and all the people were corrupt. The wicked were prevailing and the earth was filled with violence. Can you imagine a world like this? We say, well, our world is pretty bad right now, but imagine a world that was completely filled. The whole world was filled with wickedness and with violence. Genesis 6 and verse 12 and 13 say this, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Imagine a world so bad that God said, I'm going to destroy the earth. And as we saw earlier in verse uh, 8, God had shown grace to Noah. Noah's life would be spared, but he had some work to do. Noah was to build a massive ship called an ark according to God's design. We have a couple that's going to see the ark in just a couple of days. They're going to see a replica of the ark. But Noah gathered materials. He built the boat. He loaded the animals and stocked the ship with food and with supplies. And just imagine the people in his community as they were mocking him and thought he had lost his mind. Who is this crazy person? There's never been rain like this. There's never been water where you're building this ark. What is going on here? Now, there's a powerful message here in this story that I believe, even though it's Father's Day, we can apply it to man, woman, 
father, mother, teenager, it doesn't matter. We all can learn something from this story. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd be with us today. God, give me the words that you want me to say on this Father's Day. God, I'm so thankful for the fathers in my life and how special they are. I'm thankful for the men in this church that have been like fathers to me. God, I'm so thankful that you, God, are our good, good father. You are the father. You are the true father, Lord. And we are able to come to you as sons and daughters and seek guidance and wisdom from you. And we thank you that you love us the way that you do. God, I pray that as we look at fathers today and as men in general, God, we would be able to apply these things from Noah to our lives. God, that you would show us something that we can apply and that we can change in our life. Maybe we can do a little bit better. Help us to learn something from your word today. Amen. I want us to see here that God chose Noah. Why? As the Bible tells us, man looks on what? The outward appearance. But God is the one that is looking at the heart. Later in chapter 7 in Genesis, God says this about Noah. In Genesis 7 and verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come now in all thy generation into the ark. Listen to this. For thee have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. Imagine God saying that about you. That he sees righteousness in you. That he sees something different. That he finds grace in you. Noah was just blameless among the people at this time and walked with God. But in short, Noah, he was faithful. Today we're focusing on fathers, and I want to see this father and see the example of how God used him. He was a man of faith. So that's the title of the sermon today, A Man of Faith. And being men of faith is what we're looking at here. In Hebrews, we see an outline that by faith, there were several things that Noah did. As we go to number one, we see a man of faith, he follows Look back at Hebrews 11, verse 7, and look at the first beginning of the verse there. It says, by what? Faith, Noah. It says, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. I want you to focus in on that as we talk about this idea of a man of faith that follows, and then jump to Genesis again in chapter 6, going through 6 verses, uh, or 6 through 9. It says, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. So setting the stage here, understanding what's going on here, it grieved him that he had made man. Imagine that, this creation that God had made to fellowship with him. He wanted to talk and walk with these people, and all of a sudden, they have now become a wicked nation. Everyone is wicked upon the earth. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> and the Lord said, I will destroy man. And look at this, whom I have what? created. God created man. Man didn't just appear. Man didn't come out of nowhere. Man, there was no big bang, any of those things. God says, I created this. I created man from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repenteth me that I have made them. But verse eight is the turning point here for mankind. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We find in verse 9, it says that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah, what did he do? He walked with God. In a world where we are told to blaze our own path and be our own man, you know what the, the world tells us to fall after what, follow after whatever feels right, whatever we think we should do. A man of faith, he follows after the one true God. A man of faith longs for the truth of God's word. Psalms 143, verse 6 says, I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land sailor. You know what? I saw many hands raised at the beginning when we were worshiping at the beginning of the service here. I saw hands that were raised. This is what it's saying here. I raise my hands to you. Why? Because I understand who you are, God. I want to long to follow after you. As a man of God, a man of faith, we raise our hands towards God. We lift them up knowing who God is. Psalms 42 and verse 1, it says, As the heart or deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. How many of you have been warm this week, okay? That's an understatement. How many have been very hot this week? Raise your hand, okay? It has been a warm week. If you've done anything for any amount of time outside, 
guess what? You're panting for something cold, some cold water. I cannot wait to drink some cold water. I'm very, very thirsty. Okay, yesterday we uh, decided to go on a bike ride. I'll give a little bit of illustration of me as a, uh, as a person here. Um, yesterday we were riding the bikes, and guess what? I haven't ridden a bike in how many years? 20 years, I feel like. Okay, it's been a while. Um, my own bike that uh, had shocks on it and stuff like that. They're pretty sweet. But uh, the uh, bike, I'll have to stay over here. I forgot. Um, the bike that I have is a bike that was left to me by the former owner of our house. He said, hey, do you want that bike? I said, sure, that looks awesome. Um, so I had to clean it off, get it ready. And uh, so we decided to ride bikes. Well, in my mind, okay, I'm still 17, 18 years old, right? How many dads can agree with that? Sometimes we don't think properly. And I'm trying to show up for my daughter. And so this bike has some really neat shocks on it. So I was kind of bouncing a little bit. I'm like, hey, this is pretty cool. So I got going and I saw something in the path that I thought I can jump over this. I remember doing this as a kid all the time. Okay. Now I'm 37. You say, oh, you're young. Well, okay, whatever. I'm 37 years old. Haven't ridden a bike in quite a while and go to jump the thing. And when I do, my foot flies off the pedal. Well, that pedal doesn't just stop and say, okay, you know, his foot came off, we'll stop. No, that pedal does what? It swings around, and I learned very quickly that my pedals are made of metal, and they have little pointy things on them. So I'm not going to show my leg today, but if you want to see my leg after service, I'll show it to you. But that thing gripped my shin, and I went, ooh! And Becca's like, what is his problem, okay? And I'm in front, I'm kind of riding, and I'm, I'm moaning the whole way, okay? Literally, we're 100 feet from our house, and I've already done this, and we have like five miles to go. And I'm moaning, oh, what's your problem, James? What, what is going on? So we finally stopped after a few minutes. I showed her, she goes, oh, I see now. Your leg is bloody, and there's holes in your leg, okay? So I manned it out, but I told you that story just because it's funny. But here's the point. It was super hot. So when we got back home, guess what the first thing that I went for was? A cup of water, a cup of ice water. Why? Because I was panting. I, my soul longed after that. Long story short, Psalms 42 verse 1 says that the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. That idea of when you are so hot and you cannot wait to take a drink of water, that is how our soul should long for God. When you come to church on a Sunday, dad, mom, teen, when you come to church on a Sunday, is it a begrudgingly thing? Is it, oh, I got to go to church, I got to go punch my ticket, or do you long after God? A man of faith, he follows after God, he wants to, he searches for God, he longs for God. Now in Genesis 6, 5 through 7, God looked down upon the earth and he was grieved by this great amount of wickedness that was to be found. Every imagination and thought was evil, and the word, the word says there continually. It's nonstop. There is no break in it. You ever had kids and, and your kids are complaining and whining and sometimes it feels like there is no break. This wickedness was continually. God said, I'm done with mankind. But you know what? One man stood out of the crowd, a crowd that was the whole earth, one man, and this man's name was Noah. In verse 8, we see that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The thing that I want us to see here is the thing that's being applied here is this was a man that didn't just all of a sudden think, hey, I'm going to follow after God. All of a sudden, I'm going to live right. No, this was a man that had gone against the norm for many years now. This was a man that had been following after God for some time here. This was a man who had been leading his family in the way of God. This was a man that had been trying to live his life set apart for God, separate away from the world. The first mention of Noah is in chapter 5, verse 32, and we are not given his backstory. We don't know much of his history, but we know Noah was a man of faith who followed after God. You see this in how God looked at him. We need men to decide, like Joshua, that they are going to lead their families, not just deal with my family. I got to go home. I got to deal with this. I got to deal with that. Not just bear with our families, but we need fathers, men that are going to lead their families how? By following after God. Little boys and girls, they need to see an example of God in their lives. And that is why God has placed you as a father in that home, as a man in that home. Wives need to see a, an example of God in their lives, of a man that loves God's church, not just attends. That prays for his family, not just talks about sports and politics, 
a man that they see going in into his room and reading his Bible. We need men who will stand up and lead their families. And how do we begin to lead our families? By following after God. This is number one. The second thing that we see about Noah is not only was he a man of faith that followed, but he was a man of faith that moved. We need men of faith that move. We go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. We see this phrase here. It says, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, look at this, this phrase here, moved with fear. A man of faith is a man of action. He is not somebody that just sits by idly. He takes the truth of God and he puts it into practice. We see that Noah, he moved in two ways here. The first way that Noah moved was spiritually. Hebrews 11.7 says, being warned of God of things not as yet seen, moved with what? With fear. This was not a shaking in my boots type of fear. This was not a fear where I just can't budge, I can't move. The great Charles Spurgeon said this, faith was the living principle, listen to this, but fear was the moving power. Faith molded him, but fear moved him. It made him go into action. Noah didn't have the type of fear that we normally think of. Noah had this reverential aspect, this respect of God, that although nothing like this had ever happened before, no flood, no rain like this had ever happened before, nothing like this had ever been built. You're telling me to build this huge boat? I've never even seen this before. But you know what he said? I'm going to move. I'm going to do something. Spiritually, he led his family. Spiritually, he did something for them. But not only that, but physically. He believed and had faith in his heart, and his heart moved spiritually. And he began to build this ark physically. A man of faith doesn't just stand by idly and do nothing. He is involved in his family. He is doing things for his family. He is leading his family. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I know how hard many of you work. I know just being outside for a while this week, many of you are working in the sun. You're hot. You're worn out. But a man of faith, he moves. He does something. When he gets home, he leads his family. How? By following God, by physically and spiritually leading them and moving, doing something in his family's life. And then number three, a man of faith follows, a man of faith moves, but a man of faith provides. We see in Hebrews eleven seven 7, that as he followed God, was moved with fear, then he began to provide. Look back at Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, but what did he do? As he was moved, as he was molded by faith, as he's now moved by fear, what does he do? He prepares an ark. And this ark was to do what? To save his house. He provided for his family. A man of faith will provide for his family. Genesis 6 and verse 22 says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Think about that. God is commanding you as a man, as a father, as a follower of God to do something. To not sit idly by, to provide for your family, to take care of your family. Providing for your family both spiritually and physically, taking care of them. Noah provided for his family both of these ways, spiritually and physically. He began this project that would take many, many, many years. But you know what? As he was pounding in every nail... As he was moving every piece of wood, I believe he knew this is worth it because it is for my family. As you think about your family as you're at work, are you thinking that this is for my family? As you come home and you spend time with them, as you provide for them, this is for my family. Why? Because I love them. I care for them. Noah kept his eyes on God despite all the evil around him. And you know what? As dads, there's many evil things. As men, there are many evil things. They're trying to creep into our lives. They're trying to pull us away, whether it be leisure sports, whether it be things that are, that are evil, whatever it is, the devil is out to get dads because they want to break down the family. He wants to break down the family and tear it apart. But Noah kept his eyes on God despite the evil around him. Noah was not a perfect man by any stretch of imagination, but he protected his family. He provided for his family. He did what God had called him to do. Guys, we need men of faith. We need men, women of faith. We need families of faith. 
but it starts with the dad. As we learned last week about the responsibility of a father and what he is in the family, we need men that will stand up and say, I'm going to lead my family no matter what. I believe Noah was this man that even before we find him in this story, I believe he was leading his family in the right way. As Joshua said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. I believe that at some point Noah said, you know what? I'm going to lead my family in the way that I believe God wants me to lead. And we need men of faith that are going to do the same. Let's go ahead.